All right, so we have some wonderful panelists with us today. Uh, first, it's my honor and privilege to introduce State Representative Leslie Herod, co-founder of New Era Colorado, leader of the Colorado Black Legislative Caucus, author of the most sweeping police accountability and reform bill in the nation since the Black Lives Matter protests of 2020 kicked in a high gear, and all around badass. Leslie, thanks for joining us this morning. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Good to see you. You too. Second, I'd like to introduce you all to the interim chief of staff for Colorado Governor Jared Polis, Rick Palacio. Rick is the former chairman of the Colorado Democratic Party and most recently ran the Majority Institute, an organization that acts as a polling consortium for progressives to ensure organizations, candidates, and elected officials have the most up-to-date messaging and research available. And while Lisa Kaufman, chief of staff to the governor, is out on maternity leave with her new baby, Rick has been thrown from the frying pan into the fire. How's the first floor of the Capitol these days, Rick? I am doing my best to keep the wheels on. Thank you very much for doing that. It is a very difficult and generally thankless job. Third, it's my honor to introduce another co-founder and longtime former executive director of New Era Colorado, the current majority leader in the Colorado State Senate, Senator Steve Fenberg of Boulder. Steve made democracy in Colorado fun from handing out condoms to young people that said do it for democracy to their legendary voter registration and turnout operations on their gigantic bus named Tiny Dancer to their efforts to fight back against the electric utility and guarantee clean power for the residents of Boulder by winning a David and Goliath fight against the utility in 2001. New Era Colorado has registered over 200,000 young Coloradans to vote since its founding and is still a powerhouse in progressive politics today. Thanks for joining us, Steve. Thanks for having us, Ian. He's also here not quite live from the Bread Bar in Silver Plume, Colorado, <laughs> which if you'd like to visit, you need a reservation. And last but not least, <laughs> Ted Trimpa, a legendary strategist and lobbyist who was instrumental in taking Colorado from an anti-gay, anti-abortion, right-wing, fiscally doomed conservative bastion and transforming it into the progressive stronghold it is today. Ted was a longtime advisor to some of the most powerful and influential progressives in the state, and as a liaison for the Gill Foundation, found himself in the middle of the strategy to move Colorado from the hate state that passed the most egregious anti-LGBTQ policy in the country to one that was far ahead of its time in guaranteeing equal rights to everyone, regardless of their gender identity or sexual orientation. Thanks for being here, Ted. I'm happy to, happy to. Anything for you. Well, thanks so much. And I'm Ian Silveri. I run Progress Now Colorado, which was an original piece of the progressive infrastructure that had a hand in what we're here to discuss today how Colorado went from a deep red state to a bright blue one in just under two decades. So my first question for the panelists, how the hell did we do it? Rev Herod, we'll start with you. You know, it's interesting. Um, and I, I, was, I was like a little baby gay during these times, just coming out into the world. Um, and so I, I know that uh, Ted and Steve and Rick had some other things to say, but you know, I think it was, um, what I, what I would say was a takeaway for me was that there were people who were invested in very early on. Um, there were organizations that were invested in early on. So right out of college, um, we were looking for a job for Steve. Couldn't find one. And so we decided to start an organization called New Era Colorado. Honestly, it's really because we wanted to make sure that young people had a voice right here in Colorado and that we were a part of turning Colorado blue. Knowing this work had been going on for a while, but in our, like, I guess, uh, time of being students and being student leaders at the University of Colorado Boulder, me, Steve, Lisa Kaufman, Jonah Goose, we were able to meet folks like Ted and Tim and other folks who helped us to start New Era Colorado um, and were able to actually put our ideas into an organization that then had paid staff and we lived our values. And so I'm actually super proud that Steve Finberg was our first executive director. He was the brainchild behind getting New Era going and making it the strong organization that it is today. Um, me and Steve, me and Joe made up the names basically, <laughs> but Steve really um, implemented everything. But even in that, even in the trust that we got from the donors, and I know some other folks will talk about this early on in our careers. I mean, I'm talking 22, 23, 24. Um, we were able to be really bold and make changes and make mistakes that other folks maybe weren't able to do so. And so now with me and my position as state rep, Steve as his position as a, a majority leader in the Senate, Joe Nagus as Congressman, Lisa Kaufman as Chief of Staff, um, we are young leaders, but we have the experience of some folks who've been in the game for a while. 
you know, because we were able to hit the ground running and actually have our voices matter with this huge organization behind us. But we were invested in all along the way. And so when we're thinking about advice to give and talking about what other states should do, you've got to invest in folks, not just for one campaign cycle, right? You got to do it for multiple campaign cycles because we will, our majorities will continue to be attacked and we need to make sure that we have the infrastructure to push that back and actually grow our majority. I'm now the co-chair of the House Majority Project here in Colorado for the House. And so it's very important that we keep our majorities and we know we're under fire. This year, I guarantee you, we're going to do it. So I'm excited about that. So I look forward to the rest of the conversation. And thanks for letting me kick it off. No, you bet. And yeah, Colorado's House Democrats have 41 of the 65 seats in the chamber, which one could reasonably argue is possibly too many Democrats. Just kidding. Uh, House Majority Project was a job that I actually had from 2010 to 2014. Uh, where we saw a little bit of bumps in the road along the way uh, to becoming yeah. a really progressive state. We've had some more attendees join us since we kicked off. So if you haven't already, please put your name, where you're from, and if you're with an organization, which one in the chat. If you have questions for our panelists, please use the Q&A button at the bottom, and we'll get to them either during the conversation or at the end over here. I want to move over to Ted Trimpa, uh, who was here at the very beginning when Colorado was still a very, very red state. Can you tell some of the aspirational progressives that are on in the audience today from other places that are looking forward to becoming more like Colorado? I mean, everybody wants to be more like Colorado, but at least politically, what was in the original plan? What went right? And what went wrong? Well, this was initially set up um, just to win because we had spent, you know, a time period from the end of the 90s, except for a, a short period where we had the Senate, um, where it was just getting more red. I mean, ridiculously red. Um, and a group of people got together, a lot of institutions, so teachers, SEIU, AFL, I think the trial lawyers were part of this in the beginning, and individual donors, and basically just said we have to create entities in order to win. Um, we didn't care about what uh, to win. If it was legal, we would do it. And the idea was, was an arc over time to, one, create the infrastructure to make sure that you keep winning, and to have a nerve center for that, which is kind of your opposition research, which is an ongoing database and we finally have started a um, entity to do kind of a, you know, an on-ramp for candidates and to find candidates to run for office. But then the other intention was we had a coordinating entity in order to win races, but then we created a coordinating entity for all the C3s. Because the idea behind this was, and still is, um, make sure all the planes are flying in the same direction. Um, and so what you've seen is not necessarily a complete flip of the amount of money that's invested. For people like Gil, his investment used to be 70, 30, C4, uh, 527, 30% C3, and for him now that's flipped. Um, but it's really one, having coordinating entities, two, everybody agrees to fly in the same direction, um, and three, to really fully, fully utilize the C3s that you have. Thanks so much, Ted. We'll get into some of the details on the, that story a little bit later, but we appreciate the overview. Senator Fenberg, can you talk a little bit about New Era Colorado, why it was founded besides the fact that you were unemployed and uh, what it's done and what kind of markets left on politics in Colorado and what it's doing today? Yeah, thanks. Um, well, you know, Leslie kind of kind of uh, alluded to this, but in the end, it, you know, we were several of us went to college together. We were sort of student government nerds and involved in whatever activist campaign or whatever um, that came our way. And, you know, I would say we felt like we were making a big impact on a lot of the issues we cared about. And we were making a big impact on those issues, but it was relatively limited, right? When you live on a, a college campus, you're in a bit of a bubble. And we graduated college and realized that young people didn't have that vehicle or that um, opportunity for, for a real voice at the state level when it came to state politics. Um, and that's in the electoral arena as well as um, the, the policy arena. And so that's why we started New Era Colorado is to be a vehicle for young people to be a force that could be reckoned with. We knew there was power in numbers in that generation um, and we needed to engage them, mobilize them and get them uh, to, to truly be at the table. Um, and so uh, we focused a whole lot on voter registration, voter engagement, uh, making sure that young people are showing up in very large numbers. We now are a state that has one of the highest young voter turnout rates in the country. Um, and 
we are a relatively young state and those young people show up in large numbers and it has an impact, uh, not just on who gets elected and who has the majorities, but also on ballot measures. Um, and then I think that has a subsequent impact on the types of policies that come out of the legislature and the types of campaigns that candidates run. Um, because all of a sudden the issues that are, are important to young people uh, become more important to these candidates uh, for electoral purposes. And so I think it has a, a direct short-term impact. I think it has a long-term impact on our issue in political landscape. Um, and I think it really has had a big mark in Colorado. It, it's been around now, um, gosh, uh, for um, 14 years, uh, which is crazy. Um, I, you know, around year 10, I felt like the old guy uh, hanging around in the office. I was the only one that had a couple of gray hairs. Now I have a f couple more than a couple. Um, uh, and, and, you know, it felt like the right time to, to pass it off. And we never wanted this to be an organization that was about Leslie and I's generation and the issues that matter to us. It was about young people. And obviously the generation of young people will change over time. And so it was felt like the right thing to do in the right moment to pass it off to uh, the, the generation kind of right behind us and let them turn that organization uh, into what was appropriate and what was effective. Um, and they could stop hearing from the old guy uh, in the office. Um, and so it's been having a huge impact. It's a whole lot more active on issues. Um, it's obviously still very active on voter registration and making sure young people continue to be a force at the ballot box, but also in their individual communities at city councils, um, advocating for student debt relief, advocating for racial justice issues, advocating for uh, so many things that are not just important to us as progressives, but really are critical for the future of that generation's life, right? Um, these are issues that are, that are so important for the type of life they grow up in, the type of life they eventually will raise kids uh, in. So it's had a big impact, it's exciting. Um, it continues to be a force uh, and it's pretty, pretty great that Leslie and I we're a part of it at the, in those early days and continue to watch it grow and, and evolve over time. Thanks so much. Um, Rick, you've been on all sides of campaigns and candidates in Colorado from the state Democratic Party, the independent efforts, and now you're in the governor's office as the interim chief of staff. What do you think was mostly responsible from the shift in Colorado from red to blue? Well, Ian, first off, thanks for, for having me. I think that, um, the group that you've put together here is a pretty phenomenal group. And we've got a great, a great brain trust that sort of spans uh, a lot of different uh, interest areas, a lot of different areas of expertise. So I'm, I'm pretty honored that you invited me to be here. You know, I, I think when we think about the changes that have happened in Colorado, we need to remember that it happened over a long period of time. Um, this wasn't overnight. A lot of people kind of think that uh, when Democrats took control of the House and the Senate in, in the legislature uh, in 2004, that it was really an overnight and uh, something that happened by accident. It was a tremendous amount of investment over time by uh, not just donors, but also activists, an investment really in, in treasure, in, in time, in thought idea. Uh, it was uh, about recruiting amazing candidates that that not just fit the progressive mold, but they looked and they thought the way that their districts did. And I think that's really critical for not just the successes that we've had here, but um, as other states try to emulate what we've done and for the future, um, I think uh, progressives take many shapes and sizes. Uh, and I think making sure that when we're out recruiting, uh, when we're out thinking what, what might be good to build our majorities or to make a majority, uh, that we're looking outside of the, the traditional box. So I think the recruitment of, of good candidates was a, a big part of it. The, the other thing is just thinking about the long game here, and, and uh, Ted, I know, has been amazing at the, the strategy of thinking about this over the course of many, many years. Uh, when, when you create a majority or you create a situation where a majority uh, can, can happen, um, that's great to have for a period of maybe two years, but what happens four years, what happens six years, what happens 10 years down, down the road, and what are you trying to achieve as, as a progressive movement? So I think it, 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 the, the, the entirety of this is really for Colorado uh, about thinking strategically about who we're, we're recruiting, 
working collaboratively to make sure that we're electing those folks. And then once they're elected, um, making sure that there's a tremendous amount of, uh, of cooperation between all of the parts to uh, achieve whatever our progressive goal might be. That's excellent. Thanks so much. Um, so we talked a little bit about where we've been and where we come from. Let's talk about where we are right now. Representative Herod, um, it was recently reported that you spoke with Senator Kamala Harris, the next vice president of the United States, about the most aggressive police accountability and reform legislation introduced in 2020 anywhere while you were writing the bill. The bill ended up getting wide bipartisan support, but initially it was opposed by Republicans pretty strongly. In fact, a Republican sheriff from Northern Colorado said, and I quote, the actions of the state's Democratic lawmakers are just as reckless as that of the officer who killed George Floyd. That's horrible and untrue, but it shows us a little bit about where they were. The bill ended by having over 80 votes out of 100 in the legislature. What did you do as a progressive to get so many Republicans and conservatives to jump on board with this bill at the end? Bribery mostly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, this is actually, I'd love to get Steve's perspective on this from the Senate because um, I think there was a lot of things at play. One, the most important part was the fact that we had the protesters behind us the entire way. You know, COVID happened and we were on a legislative break, a recess. We came back and the protest, we came back the week the protest started, right? Um, and then the protest happened towards the end of the week. Someone shot at the crowd that I was in, right, um, in front of the Capitol. Bullets went into the Capitol. So this became not only an issue for Black people in Denver, um, but really for all of the state Capitol, everyone there, um, and the entire state very quickly. But the thing I found really interesting was that um, during that first, uh, that first protest, what people really forget about, um, President Leroy Garcia's car truck was vandalized because they thought it was a law enforcement vehicle and it was trashed, right? Um, and this was like right after the shooting, then there was chaos and then they went and kind of attacked the vehicles. And, um, and so the next morning we were on interviews together, literally six feet apart doing interviews. Um, and I think they wanted me to talk about how, you know, Black Lives Matter, the meaning of the protests, everything like that. And then him being the counter view about the, the vandalism and what happened to his truck. Well, instead, he's like, I know what they're fighting for. I get it. It's just a truck, you know? And so I kind of poked my head over like this and was like, so, Mr. President, how about we run a little bill on police accountability? Completely down. Um, and so I think that that was part of the shock value. We introduced the bill within days, but having it being introduced, and they knew it was coming because they thought it was my bill, but having it being introduced in a Democratic Senate with the Senate president um, and the assistant majority leader as the leaders over in the Senate threw people off because they thought they had the, the way they had, they thought they would have the pressure to control the Senate, but not the House, which is why majorities matter. Okay. We moved that bill very quickly. Um, but I will say it was because of um, the 24 seven nature of the bill. We worked day in and day out. Um, so funny, I was just on a panel about burnout or facilitated discussion about burnout culture, which interesting because I'm like, we are working 24 seven on this until it passes, but we did that. And, you know, we made sure that folks understood that this issue was just as important as our COVID relief bills and that we were going to get this through. And it wasn't just, um, the Senate that had our backs. The governor was hands on too. Um, uh, Kamala Harris, yes, stepped in and offered me an amazing pep talk as the bill went over the finish line. But what folks don't know, and maybe people are surprised by, um, obviously Senator Booker did as well. Actually, we talked about it throughout the bill, but so did Senator Bennett. And so did um, Governor Hickenlooper, and, you know, from his experience as the mayor of Denver. And I was pretty surprised by that too. But we are shifting what progressive means and we're able to talk about things like police reform because we have progressed, right? Because we are there now to have these really bold conversations. And in 20 years, they won't seem as bold if we do our jobs. If we do our jobs, the work that we did on 217 will look like milk toast, right? Ideally, it will get so much better from here. That's our goal. And so um, majorities really do matter. And I'm so proud that we are um, making history with our vice president um, and Kamala Harris um, as the first woman, the first black woman, and the first Indian person 
to be in this position. And I can't wait to see her cross the finish line and see where America goes with this um, presidency. Thanks so much, Representative. So Senator Fenberg, tell us the other side of the story. As a senator, um, working in the building, trying to keep your caucus all together, what did you see during the uh, police accountability and reform bill fight just a couple months ago? Yeah, I mean, I, I think everything Leslie said is right. And, you know, it, it, it's important um, to, to so much in politics is about timing, right? I mean, there, there's so much stuff where the, the timing of when something happens, when there's a spark that turns into something big, none of us can control that. But we can understand when there's a wave of energy and how to ride it to create long-term change or else it just sort of crashes on you and you don't really walk away with anything long-term. And I think that's obviously Leslie is the master at this in so many ways. Um, but, you know, it's important to know, yes, the, the George Floyd um, murder happened, the, the, um, the protests happened, and then that was as we were coming back. And miraculously, two or three days later, we introduced a huge landmark bill. Leslie largely had that bill already written. Right. It's not like uh, she was just like, well, huh, this, this is a predicament. Let me put pen to paper and see what we can come up with. Um, <laughs> but she she obviously has been working on this issue and in, in um, for a long time and actually had the, the, the at least the broad strokes, if not most of this bill that ended up passing already written and ready. And so part of it is timing. Right. And there was this surge of energy and demand uh, literally right outside the Capitol. And um, it, it, was, it was the time to get done something very big that was not just about the moment, but something that will pay off and uh, transform uh, law enforcement for many years to come. And hopefully, as we are seeing, be a little bit of a trendsetter for other states around the country. And I, one thing I would say is, you know, the House has a very healthy Democratic majority. <laughs> the Senate is pretty narrow. Uh, we have a two seat majority. So like Leslie was saying, when we started this in the Senate, people are kind of like, oh, man, OK, we thought we had time. We thought this was going to get introduced in the House and we could whittle away at the Senate. By the time I got to the Senate, they wouldn't have the votes. We drop it in the Senate and every single Democratic lawmaker uh, in the building, I think, but definitely in the Senate signed on as a co-sponsor. And I think that was a moment where law enforcement and the Republicans and a lot of folks that normally would have come out against this policy kind of realize this is going to happen. We're This is a moment in time. We are prepared and ready and we have the skills to get this policy done. And we, you know, to, to, the, to the sponsor's credit, invited those naysayers to the table, not to figure out how to water the bill down or how to compromise on our values, but how to actually make better policy, something that um, would result in a more implementable and something that could have more change faster. And um, to be honest, I think that's, as progressives, that's a lesson that we don't learn enough. Because it's right, we could have passed this bill as is, as it was introduced. I think we had a better policy in the end, uh, probably. And, in, in, you know, and there are pieces in that original bill that we're going to still pass and work on in the future. It's not like we were, it's a job well done and we move on. But what I do want to say is... Um, it, I think it was important that we didn't cram this down their throats because this is such an important time that it would not have been nearly as effective and impactful if it was a pure partisan fight. But the fact that we got to a place where some law enforcement supported it, some DAs supported it, and we had uh, every Republican except one in the Senate support this, um, I think was a pretty impressive moment in Colorado history and um, will be more impactful because of it. And it wasn't just another democratic agenda item that we, that we got through and people thought about it for years to come. But this is something that pretty much everybody in that building is proud of. And that's a pretty remarkable uh, thing to accomplish. God, I couldn't, let me just jump in real quick. I couldn't agree more. Um, and I, I appreciate uh, Senator Fenberg, Steve, what, what you're saying, because it's very true. And I think at the beginning, I didn't expect a single Republican to sign on. So I was like, fuck it excuse my language, but I was like, whatever, I got all the members on, we're going to do this thing. We've got the majority, that's what they're for. But um, the majorities give us the leeway and the leverage in the negotiation rooms, right? Like they knew it was going to pass anyway. So they weren't opposed. They were like, let's just work together on this. 
Um, and we did that. And I do think we had a stronger bill. And Ian, I missed your first question, which was how did it happen? You know, and I think that because society is shifting because of the protests and people are acknowledging that there is racial injustice and that it's real, which by the way, not everyone agreed was real um, a few months ago even, right? People started be realizing it was real. And some of these white rural Republican, former sheriffs even, we're saying that I saw, I've seen this discrimination happen myself. We need to fix it. It is very real and we have to do something about it. That's where the change happens. So I joke and I was like, which black person got to you today, sir? Like, why are you on this bill now? But I think honestly, truthfully, people were having really honest conversations because of the, con the national conversation. So whoever says protests don't matter is wrong. Whoever says that we're not making change right now is completely wrong. We are changing hearts and minds in ways that I, the last time I've seen definitely was in the LGBTQ movement. I know that Ted led, but um, it, it's quite phenomenal to see. And I'm so excited to see what we're going to be in a few years. Well, let's kick it over to Ted. So earlier, uh, you mentioned that the motto among the folks early on in the building of the progressive infrastructure was just win. Whatever you have to do, just make sure you get majorities, make sure you have Democratic governor, win seats. But then what? What are lawmakers and progressives and caucuses supposed to do once they have those majorities? Well, one, you have your democratic agenda, an agenda that you went on, but also yet basic democratic values, and you have to execute on those. Um, and I have to call out, again, not just because they're here, but Leslie and Steve uh, for the leadership. I mean, this, this stuff wouldn't have happened. I mean, Leslie was in a place not just because it was the right time, it's because it was the right thing to do. And because of the majorities, we were able to do that. So, I mean, it's kudos to them. Um, but I think you always have to keep in mind, how do you keep the power? Because you have to win elections to have power. You have power in order to, um, you know, enact, you know, whatever the agenda is you know, that you've determined and you determine it, um, quite frankly, collectively. And that's the role of leadership um, is to help guide that. Uh, it isn't just a natural, um, you know, supply demand kind of like environment that things just like percolate at the top. You have to make some hard decisions. Um, and I think that we have probably one of the best, if not the best leadership team um, that we've had for quite some time. Thanks so much. Um, Rick, you and I worked together uh, last officially when you were chairman of the Colorado Democratic Party in 2014 which yeah. I think of as the last bad year we had in Colorado. Um, <laughs> we lost the state Senate majority. Senator Udall lost to Cory Gardner, elevating the sleaziest politician in the country to the U.S. Senate. And we nearly lost the state House majority, uh, losing three seats and holding a mere two-seat majority. And that was my fault. Um, I was a House caucus director that year. But what do you think was responsible for the red wave that year? And why do you think we haven't had one like it in the last six? Well, before I, I speak to the, the responsibility of the red wave, I think what, what 2014 should remind people in Colorado and people nationally looking at Colorado is regardless of how big our majorities are in the state house right now and how thin the majority is in the state Senate and having basically all of our constitutional officers in Colorado uh, as Democrats, Colorado inherently still is uh, a, a, a swing state. We have an ability to move back and forth. We're a very big state. We're also a very rural state, as evidenced by uh, your, your background there, which I think might be the sand dunes. I could be completely wrong. But, you know, when you, when you have a large state like this, Ian, um, you know, there, there are oftentimes um, constituencies, constituencies that uh, either rise up uh, because they're mad about something or they become depressed and therefore the turnout uh, it moves in the, in the downward direction. So um, I think it's easier to maintain a blue status if you have a smaller state, if everyone sort of lives together in a, in a more compressed area. It's harder to do that over the long term without a little ebb and flow periodically in a state like Colorado. So 2014, I think, was, um, was the result of uh, you know, a, a few things that happened around the country. I mean, we would like to think that, that we're somehow immune to the national mood of the country, but we're not. Um, you know, when you have a, a president like Barack Obama, who was elected uh, by such margins and reelected by such margins in 2012, um, that does have an effect uh, on the, the, the president's party in the next election. 
And I think that's a big part of what we saw in 2014 with uh, the Udall loss and the losses that we experienced uh, in the state legislature. But we were able to hold on to our Democratic governor in 2014, which I think was a, a feat, uh, albeit by only a few points. Uh, we held on to him, which made a massive, tremendous difference in the way that we were able to uh, hold back the conservative movement that was on the heels of so many other states uh, around the country at the time. So um, 2014, mixed bag. Um, I don't think that there's one thing to point to. And certainly, you didn't fail in doing your job as caucus director. Um, but it does remind us that we need to be vigilant, right? Majorities sometimes can be incredibly short-lived. It doesn't mean that we take advantage of that majority and do everything that we can in one legislative session. It means that we have to make sure that we have our eyes wide open uh, so that we're doing everything we can electorally, legislatively, um, to, to continue to, to run the ball for the entire course of the field. Thanks so much, Rick. A reminder to everyone, some new folks have joined us as well. If you have a question for the panelists, please do type it in the Q&A section. We've got two in the queue. We'll take them in a little bit, but if you come up with something you'd like to ask, please do put it in the Q&A section. We're going to miss it if you put it in the chat. Um, so it looks Colorado won huge uh, majorities in 2018. The state turned completely blue. Every constitutional office, governor, treasurer, secretary of state, attorney general, for the first time in a very, very long time. Um, 2020, if we have an election, if the post office works and we can all get our ballots in, um, looks to be like it's following in the footsteps of 2020. But if that's true, then 2022 could very easily look a lot more like 2010 and 2014 than 2018 or 2020. What can progressives, Democrats, and strategists do to hold the line and make sure that the wins that we have racked up over the last decade don't all get wiped away in another backlash in 22. Senator Fenberg? Well, I, I mean, the, we could talk just about that question all day. Um, but I think there are a few things that we need to keep in mind, and I think we're doing it. Um, obviously, we need to be strategic. And, you know, I know there was a question in the Q&A about you, we're a blue state, sure, but we're not progressive enough uh, for the size of the majorities and the elected positions that we have. And, you know, in the end, majorities matter. And the way you get to majorities are you run people that can be elected in their communities, in their districts. And so that means, sure, yeah, we have the majority. That doesn't mean we have a monolithic majority, right? Because the only way we can win in, in Pueblo is if you run someone that Pueblo is willing to elect and that speaks to their issues and their values. Um, same with Greeley, same with Boulder, right? So these are Democrats that hold these seats, but obviously come from pretty different communities. And that doesn't mean therefore, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna just toe the moderate line and never ask for, for too much. It means we have to be strategic about how we get uh, these progressive wins. Um, so that we can get more over the course of 10 years rather than just getting what we think we can get over two years. And so um, that's one thing has been strategic about the candidates and the issues and the agendas we have in these individual districts, because in the end, I think sometimes we forget these individual local races are the building blocks of a majority. And so you can't only think about the majority agenda. You also have to think about those candidates delivering uh, an agenda for their own home communities. And the other thing is I, I think we need to make sure that we run on an agenda that we then execute once we get into office. We can't run on something that's pie in the sky and then decide to work on totally other issues once we get elected. We need to make sure that when we run, get elected, give majorities, that the next cycle, we can point to tangible outcomes that happened uh, that improve people's lives that we said we were going to work on. Obviously, it's it's difficult right now to have the the agenda we we thought we were going to have because of COVID, the 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 health crisis that's on our hands that has clearly turned into an economic crisis for so many families. Um, but we need to make sure we deliver on improving people's lives, and that sounds very elementary, but in the end, that's what people care about. Um, obviously, there are pockets of people that vote on pure social issues or very narrow things that matter in their in their little world. 
Um, but in the end, everyone's just asking for government to, to improve their lives because government is the thing we do together that we can't do alone. Um, and we need to make sure that we are keeping our eye on the prize and delivering. And that means lowering healthcare costs in a significant, meaningful way for families. That means, uh, you know, reducing congestion and not just the, the bread and butter progressive issues that we all love talking about, um, but also the, the very uh, tangible kind of, kind of, uh, you know, uh, bread and butter issues that matter at the, at the dinner table as well. So we need to make sure our agenda speaks to people and that we can deliver on that agenda and show tangible outcomes. Thanks so much. Representative Harrod, you're widely seen as one of the most progressive members of the legislature, but you do know how to work with sort of more moderate Democrats, even Republicans. Um, the tension, the theoretical tension that uh, Ben in the chat kind of expressed, how do we go from a blue state to a progressive state? What Senator Fenberg was just talking about, where we, the major and what Ted said, win first, then execute on the agenda second. Yeah. What? How do you balance the tension between trying to charge hard and do the most progressive stuff you can do, and making sure that you can keep the majorities and keep power so that you don't end up sliding backwards, handing the bad guys the gavels in the legislature, and then leaving time on the table where you could be accomplishing more progressive goals. Yeah, so I think I 100% agree with what Steve is saying. And there's also tension in what Steve is saying with what I believe, right? So um, to answer all the questions, I believe we have to be bold. I think we have to live up to our values and what we promise. And we need to take credit for that as Democrats. So, you know, that is something that um, when you talk about some of the, the other wins, like say transportation or, you know, people don't necessarily associate with democratic wins because we don't talk about it enough, you know? Um, and I think sometimes we got to put our, our, our humbleness aside and say that we are doing this because we have the majorities and we are here as Colorado um, because of our majorities that we, that we have now. Um, so we have to like take credit for those wins, but I also think we have to take bold action. And when I'm talking about bold action, I mean, two seventeens. we need to have some of those every year, not too many, right? The right amount. But if they're already going to say we're taking over, even though the Republicans voted on it, right, um, then we need to do it bold and people need to feel it. People need to think that we're responding to them and see it in action. Um, and so I think we need to pick some of those tough, bold issues and move on them um, to show folks that we are standing up for something, that it does matter that we have majority and that we're not just playing around in the middle, but that we're actually making progressive change. I would argue that Colorado has done that. I just don't know that we've already always said that and shown that. Um, so we lose our base, right? And so what happens is, in my opinion, is you have all these folks that are gonna come out for the presidential. Like definitely we're gonna have an amazing year for Colorado um, this year. 2022 is gonna be tough. It's gonna be even more tough if we don't keep our base because we haven't done anything that was progressive enough to keep the folks that turned out. Our voter registration right now is up across the country, right? But it's up and it's progressive folks who've been coming out for these um, protests and demonstrations and showing up and it's young folks. They will vote once, but don't expect them to vote again if we haven't shown them anything, you know? And so I think we have to do that. But then also I would say to everyone who's like listening in on the chat, don't forget to say thank you because I will be very clear. There are Democrats who put their seat on the line to pass 217 because it's what the people wanted and because it was the right thing to do, period, you know? But they are getting slammed in their rural districts, right? They are getting hit hard by people who they've never had to argue with before, their sheriffs, their chiefs, you know? And it's uncomfortable for them. And I say, that's fine, that's good, be uncomfortable. And they're still fighters, but the communities come out and support them too and say, thank you, you know? One thing I noticed, I was in the um, Ritter administration when we passed a lot of marriage equality. One thing I noticed as his senior policy advisor was we got a lot of emails talking about kill that bill. A lot of emails talking about all of those, all of the bills we passed, get rid of them. We got very few saying pass it or um, thank you in comparison. So just remember not to leave folks high and dry when they come out and they put their necks out. And I would say that every Democrat in Colorado who voted on 217, which is every one of them in the House and the Senate deserve a thank you um, and a how can we have your back. That's how we get them to continue to vote on progressive policy. Thanks so much. Ted. Oh yeah, please, Rick, go ahead. On what Representative Harris said, I think it's incredibly important. I, I also think that we need to 
while we may not agree with Republican, the Republicans who did vote uh, for these measures, uh, while we may not agree with their overall um, political mindset, when they do something right, when they vote for our bills, the th things that the progressives support, we should also make sure that we thank them. Because as you said, they are, um, they're hearing it from their own constituents. And we have to make sure that if we're moving people along or the way to move people along uh, to, to especially people in rural parts of, of, of America and rural parts of Colorado is to give them some room to join our cause. We can't just, uh, it, when they're on our side, we need to make sure that we thank them as well. Because I think I just want to say something on this. Yeah, please. As, as our majorities increase, you could see the Republicans going farther and farther right. I mean, farther and farther in back of the cave, banging two sticks together in order to create life. That, that's going to spin itself out, and they're going to figure that out. Um, and we're starting to see that trend line. Uh, this, actually, this, this last primary election, we're more moderate. I wouldn't necessarily call it moderate, but just not the crazies won in almost every single Republican primary. And so I think it's very important, just what Rick was saying, that it's when we can get some Republican support on something, we need to reward that. Um, because if we don't, we're gonna end up losing a majority. Um, so anyway, I just think it's really important to do what Rick and Leslie are talking about. Well, I actually wanted to push you on that a little bit because Ted, I mean, I, you and I have talked about this offline and, and somewhat publicly as well. I know you might share a different uh, theory than Representative Herod about how we make sure we guard against backlash and how we make sure we can hold our majorities. I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but is it possible that progressives go too far and then alienate the moderate swing voters that brought them there? And if so, do you think we're currently in danger of doing that? I think you have to calibrate it. Um, you know, I think that you know, the debate we've been having isn't, at least from my perspective, whether or not there is some, violence is too strong of a word, but some level of destruction um, versus absolutely none. I mean, I, if with protests, you're gonna get some level. The question is where and what you're doing and the institutions that you're affecting, because you don't wanna lose um, those independent voters. That's not to say that you need to water everything down, you never do, you never push like Leslie's pushing, but to Steve's point, You've got to calibrate some of this because we could get to a point, particularly here in Colorado, where you're seeing a slight move more towards the middle with some of these Republicans um, that we could end up having a wave election the other way. It's not going to happen this time. We're going to gain seats, I think. Um, I think we just need to be smart about what we do. Yeah, uh, Ivan writes in the chat, um, if we want to appeal to young voters, we need to appeal to them with the policies they want, which are the progressive ones. Um, and yes, in Colorado, we have excellent young voter turnout, but unfortunately, it's still those 55 year and older voters that make up a huge majority of the voting bloc. So how do you calibrate? I'm going to open this up to anybody who wants to answer. Mm -hmm. How do you calibrate that? How do you choose when to push, when to pull back, when to go really hard, really forward, or when to try and like bring Republicans along with you? I, I'll just jump in real quick. I, I think it is our responsibility to always push, to always do what Leslie was describing, because we didn't get elected and we, we don't do this work. Um, because we want to be in office, right? We didn't do it because we want to win. We did it because we actually have something we want to accomplish. So I think it's our responsibility, it's responsibility always to push and to, and to go for the bold policies that impact people's lives in real ways. The question is, how do you do it? And I think that's where it's very nuanced and it matters. And I think 217, which we keep talking about, is such a good example, right? I mean, we didn't compromise on that you know it's not like we passed some like silly bill that doesn't do anything in the end um but we did it in a way that i i think doesn't guarantee you know backlash from voters for this next cycle and i think there are many other examples of that and i think we are for the most part pretty smart about it um it doesn't mean we have to um calibrate our values it means like how do we accomplish this and what is the road the roadmap to do it I think another bill this past election or past cycle was um, uh, paid sick days. Uh, and it's the most progressive paid sick leave uh, policy in America. And we did it with like 
some businesses and even some Republicans coming along with us. Uh, and so I think we do need to think about how do we use majorities to make sure that we can accomplish our agenda for the long term rather than do it in a way, again, like I said earlier, that just results in a couple of victories in the short term. And let me talk super inside for a second, um, Ian. Like, we need to have the majorities in the House and the Senate that are not just the plus one, but more than plus one, so that we can actually provide cover for those who maybe can't vote on a 217. We can always do that by picking up Republican votes. So while I might be one of the most progressive people might feel I'm one of the most progressive people in the legislature, and I appreciate that. I've always found a Republican to run some of my most progressive legislation with me, right? So even though we have like Senator Cook and actually a ton of, of white male Republicans sign on as co-sponsors for 217, drug defelonization, huge bill, ran by a white Republican former law enforcement officer, okay? You got to get to know people for who they are and meet them where they are and then try to get them to vote with you. But I needed those votes in order to allow some Democrats who maybe didn't feel like they could take that risk and be reelected again to not to not to, to vote no if they needed to. So we need strong majorities. And that's hard to swallow. Right. Because maybe you're represented by someone who might be more moderate. Well, to be honest, if you want to see me in leadership, Steve in leadership, we need to have those people come back. So we need you to have their backs, but know that we have conversations with them about if they're, if they're going to kill a bill or not, you know, and if we can pull them, like get them in the right direction, or if maybe it is a better calculation for them to vote no, but still push the policy on amendments, still push the policy out of committee, you know? So there is a lot of inside baseball that happens, but we're able to do that strategically with the majorities. But to be clear, we would not have had the Republican support um, or the Republicans come to the table if we didn't have the majority to pass the bill. If we would have come out with a different strategy, we would not have been able to be as bold. Um, and they would have just tried to kill the bill um, as they had done in previous years or water it down to nothing. And so the reason why it's so important that like me and Steve are in the positions that we are um, is because we are able then to lead the policy from the inside, even if we know some of those folks are less safe. But we still need you to vote for them. We actually really still do. Um, and then one other thing I'll say is, you know, while Ted might come off as a bit more conservative on these issues, um, it is actually, and, and Rick, love you both. Um, we also need to make sure that we have folks who understand the repercussions and have been there to also be a part of the conversation too, right? I'm not going to call you guys my elders, but I will make, I'll remind people that um, when we started, when we went to uh, found New Era Colorado, the first person I went to was Ted and I asked for a quarter of a million dollars, right? Like, I mean, I'm not like, I wasn't like messing around. It was like, hey, I'm this young new chick, like really need your support. We're friends. Can you find me this money? I don't know where to go to for a million dollars, you know? And By the way, helped. Ted, they're still waiting for that check. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he helped me. But also when Rick took over the majority and worked in the Senate or uh, in the um, house, he hired me. Right. And so, it's really interesting how all of these things play together, but we got to respect each other's opinions and where we come from. And, you know, I'm always going to push. My friends know that because I think we need to be as bold as possible and we need to talk about it and we need to not shy away from those victories. Yeah, I, Leslie, I think that you're exactly right. And I think it speaks to the long game of how we do this, right? Our boldness can't just be a flash in the pan. It has to be a fire that burns over a long period of time. And that means what I think has been done brilliantly in the state of Colorado by our Democratic leadership is really making sure that we're not leaving people behind. Right? We, we are governing for an entire state that is incredibly large and incredibly diverse. Uh, when we start to get off uh, off track, and I think when it gets into the danger zone is when people feel like they're not part of the victories that, that we have uh, as a state. And it doesn't mean just uh, Democrats who feel that way. Everyone in the state or everyone in your, your city or your district should feel the benefit of the boldness that you have been able to, to bring to the table. It's a pretty excellent transition to a question we've got in the Q&A here from Jennifer. Uh, she asks, any thoughts on what we might do for rural Colorado? Infrastructure, internet, water issues, of course, environment, agriculture. Seems like there might be overlapping interests there. And I want to put a little bit of a finer point on it. In 2014, when Cory Gardner defeated Senator Udall by less than two percentage points in a red wave year, he didn't do it by winning the suburbs. 
Senator Udall won Jefferson County that year and, and disrupted an entire missing Colorado politics that if Jefferson County goes one way, the rest of the state goes. That was the first time in a long time that wasn't true anymore. Um, but, but Cory Gardner was able to really blow out the rural parts of the state and Democrats kind of left it uncontested. So what do we do about rural Colorado? How do you make sure that you're not leaving votes on the table and these folks that actually identify with us and agree with us, especially from like a race class narrative standpoint, what do we do to bring them along and make them understand that it's not this urban rural divide that actually progressives and rural voters share tons of values. And sometimes fairly often I'd argue conservatives don't necessarily share the values of the constituents they claim to represent. I think this is a question that Rick should be answering. Uh, coming from Pueblo, being in Colorado for so many years, being literally the best state party chair that we ever had, um, and visiting every single county. Um, I just think he would have some unique insight because he's actually been all over. I'm sure Leslie and Steve have been all over the state. Um, but Rick was like in the weeds. Uh, so from my perspective, I'd love to hear his answer to that because I have no idea how to answer that question. So Mr. That's Pueblo? That's it? I said Mr. Pueblo? Pueblo. Um, I, I think I, I mentioned it in the last comment where, where people can't feel like they're left behind, right? It, it's not just about the, the suburbs and the urban parts. It's not just about the I-25 corridor. And for anyone who's not watching from Colorado, that basically means the Denver side of the mountains uh, that where the population uh, to be actually... Uh, in. People have to feel like um, their elected officials are paying attention to their bread and butter issues, the things that keep them up at night. And the things that keep them up at night in Moffa County or Mesa County are the same things that keep us up at night in, in the city of Denver or the city of Aurora or Boulder. Uh, sorry, Steve. Um, it's, it's, uh, it, those are the shared things. Those are the commonalities I think that we need to address to make sure that we're not leaving people behind. Um, infrastructure is a huge part of it. When it comes to especially operating in a post-COVID world or a current COVID world, um, more people are working from home. We need to make sure that they can work from home and they could do it in a, a, a sustained way. Making sure that every community across your state has access to broadband, um, has an ability to make sure to, to run a business from their own home, right? I mean, from the state of Colorado's uh, perspective, I think a large portion of the state's um, uh, employee base now is working from home right now. And I would imagine that in a new type of government, in a post-COVID world, um, a lot of states are looking to uh, keep that going for a long period of time. So um, it, it, there, there are some sort of quality of life things that we need to make sure that we address so that people in rural parts of your state um, can stay there. Uh, and, and it's about economic issues that really are the, the root of it, right? People have to be able to, to, um, to pay their bills, put a roof over their head, to support their kids, um, put food on the table from wherever they want to live, not just in, in uh, the suburbs or, or urban areas. Representative Herod, uh, the House majority, 41 out of 65 Democrats, which is historic and enormous, um, is built on urban and suburban districts, but you have quite a few members of your caucus that are from rural Colorado these days. How do you balance the tension within the caucus when it comes to things like police reform, when it comes to things like infrastructure investments, um, specifically, you know, folks like Representative Bree Buentello from Pueblo and Representative Barbara McLaughlin from the southwest corner of the state? Yeah, I think the first thing to do is listen. Those members know their districts well if they go out and do what Democrats do best, which is knock doors and talk to their communities. Like they, we don't hide in corners, right? Like we actually go to where people are and have the conversations. And during this COVID time, we're doing so much more to just make sure that we're staying connected. So I think we, as, as folks, you know, who are, you know, I'm, I'm a chair of finance, vice chair of judiciary. It's important that we actually listen to our members and then head out to those districts. Listen, Folks are confused when they see a strong black lesbian like myself show up in a coffee shop in Grand Junction or in Rifle or in wherever, Montrose. But it's once they get past the initial shock value, um, they realize that we're actually not all that different, as Rick was saying. And the thing that I find really interesting is so many times um, our strategists uh, rely so heavily on polls, more so than I think most folks even realize, not just for the presidential, but on issues too. 
But too often, if you don't have the right folks at the table, like a queer person of color at the table, we don't even ask the questions. So people just assume that everyone outside of Denver is not down with police reform. We know that now not to be true, but you know, they know that because they were actually talking to folks in their district and they were responsive. But before that, I couldn't even get a question about police reform on a poll unless I like, like threaten somebody basically, you know, I mean, it's crazy, right? So we need to have, you need to make sure that where we can, we elect really progressive people who can be at these tables and support them so that we can have these really forward thinking conversations. But I knew, I had confidence that rural Colorado would be supporting this too, because I worked with Republicans on asset forfeiture reform. And what I realized was in rural Colorado, it's again, not much different than Denver. The difference is maybe the color. So where black folks, brown folks, low income folks, indigenous folks, you know, believe that we need police reform, you might not have that same group in rural Colorado and the conversation might look very different. But what you find out is that there's usually in a small town, there's two families. One family is law enforcement, one family is not law enforcement. And just like in the movies, like they fight with each other. And the one who has the power who is in law enforcement typically, not typically, can maybe abuse or, or seen as abusing that power to, to keep down this group. So then all of a sudden you've got 50% of rural Colorado who's saying, actually, we do support this, of conservative rural Colorado. It's kind of that libertarian side that says we actually do support police reform. And if you can get them to be a part of the coalition, you've got a big enough and broad enough coalition to pass a bill. And but that comes from being bold and asking the right questions and showing up in those areas where they're not expecting to see you. It goes so far. So I just say, again, everyone listening and watching, go show up at some of these meetings, Go show, even if it's on virtual, it with the, even with the Republicans and find out where their values are and where they might align with our progressive values. Because I gotta tell you, they might not call it progressive throughout the state of Colorado, but there are some things that they believe in that very much are progressive or have been harmed in ways that are very similar to how we've been harmed. We might just call it something a little different. And that's where we find the right connections and the right um, coalitions to win. Ian, one, one, one quick point on that. I think Leslie's spot on that one shouldn't assume that on police reform, that people in rural areas don't support policies like that. But people who live in cities also should not assume that our, our city representatives do not support farmers and ranchers in other parts of the state as well. Absolutely. Those are, those are values that we, that we could lean on as uh, lead with as well. That's a great yeah, point. And, oh, go ahead, please. I'm sorry, Ian, we made a good point. Like, I don't know why people think that Denverites who love to go to these fancy restaurants that we have here in Denver think our food just comes from the sky. I mean, obviously we want to support our ranchers and farmers because we love to be able to say, take pride in our state too and say that we are supporting Colorado. We are supporting Colorado ranchers and farmers, but we got to make that connection more strong and more, more prominent so folks know that we're not as far apart as they might assume. And none of us will ever, ever eat a New Mexico chili. Senator yeah. Fenberg, um, you got a bit of a smaller majority in the state Senate, 19 to 16 out of 35 uh, senators. You've got 19 of them in your caucus. And this election cycle, 18 of them are up for re-election in one way or another. Um, are there opportunities for Democrats to expand the map into rural Colorado? And if so, what kind of candidates and issues uh, are you running out there? I think there are. Um, and, you know, I, I would actually say there are multiple places for expansion, not just rural Colorado. It's also the suburbs. Um, some suburbs have uh, generally been battlegrounds and they've gone our way here and there. Uh, but there are, there are some that are on the more conservative end of the spectrum that are, are actually more up for grabs this cycle uh, than they've ever been. So we're excited about those opportunities. But then also, like you said, there are some in rural areas that we are uh, going after. And I think we have um, we have the ability to, to uh, use to grow our majority. So one is on the Western Slope largely. Um, and, uh, it, you know, we are our member or our candidate that's running um, really is from that community. He, he, um, he's a water attorney and obviously water law is a big deal um, in, on the Western Slope and a lot of these communities. And he's also, um, you know, he, he's, he's, he plays the part because he is the part. That's the community he comes from. Uh, and also, um, especially like in times like now when, um, thanks for uh, dinging me guys. 
with the with the text messages uh they're they're probably giving me shit because i didn't mute my my text messages like i was told um so uh that you know in times like now where we have one of the worst fires in our state's history um rural voters care about the climate right they don't just care about uh ranching and farming um they don't just care about water because that's their livelihood they care because that is their community that is their lifestyle that is their home uh, and, and I think, you know, the writing is on the wall. We are moving uh, into a place where uh, our energy sources are going to be more renewable and greener over time. And, and the old way of uh, how we think about energy production is not going to be the, the future. And um, I, I think for the most part, rural Coloradans uh, understand that and they want a party that's actually going to be proactive in creating that future with them, uh, rather than just hanging on to something that probably isn't going to be uh, uh, in existence in the, in the long term. So I think that's how we're doing it. We're looking for candidates that are actually talking about the issues that matter to these districts uh, and thinking proactively about what's around the corner. Let me zoom out a little bit and ask a question. Thank you for your colorful boa, Rick. We appreciate it. Um, let me zoom out and ask a question that uh, it might be a little bit controversial, but I think it's okay. Um, is Colorado a blue state? No. Why not? I think we're all the colors of Rick's boa. Yeah, I mean, I, we're, we're blue right now. I just think that it's, it, we gotta be careful assuming, because you gotta think about where voter registration is. I mean, the block that has the most are unaffiliated. And when you say unaffiliated in Colorado, that doesn't necessarily mean independent, they just don't wanna affiliate right. with the party. And that swings back and forth. Right now it leans democratic. That could end up leaning at some point Republican. And there are certain districts particularly some of these suburban ones, um, that could put us in trouble, which is why I said earlier, I think it's really important for us to try to run up, get as much many points on the board as we can, because uh, we're going to start to see some of that swing back. What do you think, Representative Harrod? Are we a blue state? You know, I don't, I don't think so. And it's Coloradans have a tendency to split the, the ballot. It's not that um, we are purple because, you know, one area votes red and one area votes blue. It's that we actually split tickets, right? And so... I think we're we're helping Colorado Coloradans learn a different way, um, and then why it matters not to think that the attorney general should be a Republican if you're going to pick a Democratic governor, you know. Um, but folks need to like do that for a while, and again, see results. And you know, back to what we said earlier, like people aren't going to believe that we are really going to help rural people around uh, climate change if we don't pass bold policies that actually affect climate change, right? If we just go around the edges, they're going to think that we're all the same. You know, and that nothing has changed for them in their real lives. So, um, so Coloradans really care about what we're doing, and they care about results. You know, um, and if we don't deliver that, they will vote a different a different way. Um, but I do think we have an opportunity now. But it, it, I think there is um, there is justification for caution. Senator Fenberg. Yeah, we're we're not a solidly blue state. I mean, it, we are a state that is controlled by Democrats at this moment. Uh, you know, and, and we have a, it, it would be very short-sighted and I think it would, um, we, we, it, we will regret saying we are a blue state and getting too comfortable. Uh, you know, we have these Democratic secretaries of state, attorney general, um, uh, treasurer, but um, that's been the case for two years they were all Republican before that. Um, and so uh, it's not it's not like uh, we have been uh, controlled by Democrats now for um, for generations, uh, like some states. Um, this is new for us, and it could change easily. Um, like you said, in the Senate, we have the majority by two seats. If we mess up on two seats or have a year where we just lose two seats, we're no longer in the majority and we don't have a trifecta, and we now can't get things like 217 uh, through the legislature and on the governor's desk. So it's precarious. We definitely shouldn't uh, get too comfortable. We need to always be thinking about, yes, how do we move the agenda forward uh, in a way that is for the long term, not just, not just this uh, election cycle or this legislative session. Rick, what do you think? Blue state, swing state, purple state, but rainbow is state? We are a state like like my rainbow boa. Um, we had a, a little bit of an inside 
uh, text thing going on, sort of making fun of uh, Steve for not putting uh, his, his phone on mute. Um, so I thought I could throw the, the rainbow boa on to just distract. And also in solidarity between Leslie and our gayness, right? Um, so are we a blue state? No, absolutely not. We are a state that... Um, don't, that don't forget about Ted's gayness, too. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All of us were about to say that. <laughs> Sometimes I forget uh, about your gayness because your whiteness is so bright, Ted. Wow. <laughs> I think that, I think that um, at any minute, in any election cycle, I think that Colorado could swing a different direction. We could end up with a, uh, again, a, a Senate that is a majority Republican. We could end up in a House that's a majority Republican. Uh, we could end up with a, a, a Republican as, as any of our constitutional offices um, because it's such a big, such a diverse state. And we need to just make sure, again, that uh, we're representing everyone in our state, regardless of the district uh, where we were elected. So let me ask the next question. What could take us back to being a red state? I mean, are we just uh, victims of the ebb and flow of the political environment on the national level? Is it Trumpism versus everybody else? What are the things that either progressives could screw up or conservatives could figure out that could bring us back to where we started two decades ago? I'd rather yeah, not think, I think about that. Showing up. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I think not showing up and not living our values, right? And um, allowing the next two years to be a time of, of not working hard for our constituents um, and for Coloradans. Um, I don't see that happening, you know? I, I, I just don't see it. I know that the people that we're electing and reelecting are really hard workers and care about, um, care about their constituents and their district. Otherwise, I think they would probably pass up on the seat right now because the work is really hard. Um, the work is, is taxing, especially, you know, leading through a pandemic, which, none of us really ran on. I mean, that wasn't our campaign. Um, and so I'm proud as hell of my colleagues, you know, every single one of them for the work that they've done. And I know that they want to do, take bold action um, for issues that matter to their constituents. So I don't see it happening, but if we don't do it, um, we will lose those seats. Absolutely. And we probably- theme, will Yeah, I think a key theme among all of this is to listen. Listen to your constituents. And sometimes that's going to mean we're not going to be able to go as far left as we want to. And sometimes that means we can go farther left than we thought, like what happened with police reform. I just think the key is listening and don't presume where they're going to be because rural folks may be in a place that you're not expecting and uh, in a happy way. Yeah, I think it's a collaboration piece. When we stop collaborating, when we stop cooperating, when we stop uh, thinking about um, who we are as, as, a, uh, as a state, I think things certainly very easily uh, could move the wrong direction. Yeah, I, I, I think if we, if we don't deliver on our promises, whether that's to our base, uh, we become vulnerable, or whether that's to the population at large, we become vulnerable. And, um, and so I think it's, there, in some ways, we are all sort of saying the same lesson, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and, and that is that if we ran on a bold agenda, which uh, in a lot of ways we have, and that's that's what we stand for. We need to deliver on that or else we're going to lose the faith of the people that got us there. But also we can't ignore that we we also ran on lowering healthcare costs and building some roads for people and getting broadband internet to some of these communities. And we can't forget about that too. We also need to deliver on those promises. So another key uh policy victory as a result of having progressive majorities came in 2013 after um, Democrats retook the state house of representatives, had a majority in the Senate and John Hickenlooper was governor. Um, house Bill 1303, which created our much vaunted universal mail ballot system in Colorado, where now we look like geniuses because uh, a lot of us are, you know, not going to be able to go vote in person this year. 99% uh, of Coloradans either vote by mail or drop it off. Uh, less than 1% actually vote in person. Um, so we've all read the news in the last couple of days and seen the trucks full of mailboxes being whisked away in Oregon and other places. Can something like House Bill 1303, the universal mail ballot system that progressives set up in Colorado, actually protect us from some of the shenanigans that are going on on the federal level when it comes to this election? That's a Steve question. I'm say absolutely, but 
Steve, take it away. I mean, I, I would say yes, it, it can insulate us. Um, we have a Democrat Secretary of State, uh, and that helps as well, right? But, but we have a, a system where our voters are used to voting by mail, and they, they, get, they get it now. Um, if we were one of these states that didn't really have that in our culture and had to do it overnight, and the USPS was falling apart, we would have some problems. Um, so I do think we have had, we have several things working for us and that's secretary of state that cares about people voting. <laughs> Can't really say that about all secretaries of state um, and, uh, and a system uh, that we have had several years now uh, um, in the making that, that people understand, they have faith in it. And, and it wasn't just 2013. I mean, we, this is actually like a slow uh, evolution towards what we did in 2013, 1303, the, the, the bill you were talking about, Ian. Um, we actually had good mail ballot laws in, on the books for several years. And that's actually why 1303 was so successful. It's because people already started getting used to mailing ballots. Um, they did it on odd year elections, but not the even ones. And then it was no fault. So you could request it and no questions asked. And then we eventually got to uh, what you were saying, which is essentially 99% people vote by mail in one way or another. Um, but we still have polling sites open. So when, you know, Anderson Cooper talks about this on the news and stuff and says Colorado is an all mail state, we're actually not. We're an all options state, meaning no matter who you are, if you're eligible, mm -hmm. you can vote. Whether you've registered ahead of time or you need to register on election day or you got a mail-in ballot or you moved and so your address is incorrect and you didn't get your mail-in ballot, you can send it back in the mail, you can drop it off at a drop box, you can still go in person, you can vote early or on election day. So, so we literally have what we liked from every state and put it into one model and that's what the Colorado uh, voting model is and that's I think why um, we, we are in good shape because we have many uh, we don't just have one way of voting. We have multiple, and we intentionally wrote our policy to make sure that if someone did fall through the cracks, didn't get their ballot, didn't have their ID, whatever it was, that we actually have a way to ensure that person can still uh, cast their vote, no matter who you are and what your individual situation is. Yeah, and let me give a quick plug to Senator Finberg. We ran a bill together just recently to allow parolees to vote as well in Colorado. So um, regardless of your, your status, if you are not incarcerated uh, with a conviction, um, you can vote in Colorado. Even if you're pretrial in jail, you can vote. And so, um, and that is an all, <laughs> all option thing. Um, I like to exercise all of my options. Um, just once each cycle, but uh, <laughs> I'm a person who has my mail ballot, especially when they're long, you know, and then I take it to the polling place because for me, it's like almost like a pilgrimage in honor of my ancestors who have fought so hard for the right to vote. So I go up to Hiawatha and I vote in person with my ballot, you know, and sometimes I mess around with the machine. Sometimes I like to wait to see who's going to call me and ask me to vote. I know some folks hate that, but I do. Um, and I think it's so important that we have all those options at the table because again, it's responsive to Coloradans and it meets people where they are. So we have about 15 minutes left and uh, there's a couple more questions in the Q&A, but I have one more I wanna get to real quick on my list over here. So what do we have to say to other states like Arizona, Texas, Georgia, North Carolina, who are sort of on the cusp of being progressive? We've had a few disappointing election cycles and a few encouraging election cycles in each one of those states over the last few years here, and maybe 2020 is it, um, a state like Texas goes blue for the president, and that basically ends the electoral college math for Republicans from that point forward. What advice can we give them, lessons that we've learned, what to do or what not to do um, for these aspiring progressive states who are on their way? Run on issues that win, 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 because you can't exercise power unless you have it. Sometimes it's like, it's like when we were doing gay in the early, early days. To win races, we didn't talk about gay. We talked about whatever the issues mattered within that district. And then once we had power, then we started doing things uh, that were pro-LGBTQ. So from my viewpoint, it is think about winning first. Rick, what do you think? I hit it right on the head. I think we've got to, we've got to make sure that we win this district. 
I mean, Leslie pointed out my my moderate uh, my moderate streak uh, earlier, and I think she's uh, she's exactly right. I think that we just um, we can't uh, we can't die on the hill. We have to make sure that the issues that we're running on are issues that really resonate with a, a broad a broad swath of, of people and aren't leaving people out. And I think um, that when we think about it that way makes especially the act of recruiting all the all the year and i think the recruitment efforts that need to take place on the front end in uh, places like north carolina and georgia and arizona and, and others are are absolutely critical to make sure that that, um, that they have an ability to take their majority back as well Representative Herod, what advice do you have for aspiring progressive states that want to follow in our footsteps? Run with women. Women win. Um, I will say that, shout out to my girls, like we, we win. And um, we got, you know, Representative Tatone, we've got uh, Senator Winter, we've got um, Brie Buentello out in Pueblo. I mean, these women have all flipped seats. Steve, you got some more, and I know I'm forgetting some. I should never have started mentioning people's names because I always forget. Like, Politics 101, right? Um, but run with women. Like, don't be afraid to put a woman on the ticket. Don't be afraid to put a trans woman on the ticket, a queer woman on the ticket, a woman of color, a black woman, because we actually do win, you know? Um, and, and that's living your values too, when you can actually lift up and highlight a different type of candidate. And so um, so that's my advice. Um, and, and definitely, you know, again, people of color, but make sure you're giving them their, your support. Now, people talk about progressives, and I saw in the chat folks talk about Jonah Goose. People forget he lost Secretary of State. He lost that race, you know? Um, and that was in one of our down years. And so we've got to remember that, that we got to get out there and support. We do have vulnerabilities um, on our side, which is why we have to, to carry it through. But also, again, run with women and, yes, diverse candidates. It's true. Women are a majority of, I think, both caucuses, uh, the House Dems and the Senate Dems at this point. Majorities were built, uh, Democratic majorities were built on suburban female candidates. There's no doubt about that. Uh, Senator Fenberg, what advice do you have for uh, aspiring progressive states? Well, I, I think I agree with everything that's been said. I think also make sure you're taking the long view, lay out a plan that is more than one election cycle. Um, for some states, it might be a decade, and that seems real depressing. But just the way races come up, the way the maps work, the way there could be structural uh, uh, disadvantages, right, for how voting occurs in some states, you may need to look longer than one election cycle. And what I would also say is for those states that get a majority or get a very narrow majority um, or that have the governor's office but not the legislature, Think about what you can do with that majority. Obviously, not. Obviously, you should think about what you can do to advance the progressive agenda. But also, don't only think about individual siloed issues, but think about structural reforms that can create power for progressives over the long term. So, for instance, um, you know, it, I think it's really important when you have a democratic majority, you, in one way or another, through the government, have the power to do it. Make sure you are passing policies that, that provide power for workers, right? Don't just think about, um, you know, little individual policies here and there that will improve a worker's life, but how do you give them power so that they can be uh, in charge uh, in one way or another over the long term? So I, and, and also on election reforms, don't just figure out how to how to uh, have more mail-in ballot voting, but think about what is the long-term structural changes you can make to ensure that you are setting a foundation so every single person will be able to vote every election. Um, I, I think it, it's really important to think structural. The right has done that for generations. We sometimes do it, but often not nearly enough. And that's where it pays off, and that's what creates majorities for the long term. So Paula Diamond Roman asked, in the Q&A section. Um, how blue is the state legislature? I think we answered that part, but concerns about redistricting. This is an interesting question. Colorado used to have a legislative redistricting and reapportionment system, but in 2018, the voters passed amendments Y and Z that creates this independent commission um, based off of states like Iowa and Arizona and some others. 
um, that's basically out of the control of the legislature for the very most part um, in order to try and um, create fair maps. Now, I would argue that over the last decade, um, we've had very fair maps because both parties have controlled one chamber or the other of the legislature the entire time. And a couple of congressional seats have batted back and forth. So that to me seemed pretty clear that we already had competitive maps, but the voters decided they wanted to bring it to an independent commission. The question that Paula Diamond Roman simply asked is any concerns about redistricting coming up this year, especially now that we've built these big majorities in both chambers? Okay, I'll be the turd in the punch bowl. Um, independent commissions mean that when you're in power, you now don't have the power to draw the seats in a way that are gonna benefit you. Um, and the reality of it is, is that when we've had power over those years, we drew the seats to the extent that we could to benefit progressives, to benefit Democrats. Now, is it the right thing to say that you really shouldn't do that? Of course. Um, but if it's just strictly a power dynamic that you're talking about, um, you know, you run the risk over time, uh, making it more and more difficult in order for Democrats to win, because this comes back to what we've been saying, and that is Colorado isn't bright blue. You know, again, you know, unaffiliated are the largest block of registered voters. You don't know for sure which way they're going to swing. Um, and it's just going to make us more difficult, make it more difficult over time for us to keep seats for Democrats. Representative Herod, thoughts on redistricting? I mean, redistricting is like the most important thing that we could be thinking about right now. I mean, I know folks kind of, um, I guess the most, it's the most important thing that's most, that's least talked about right now, you know? And we've obviously got a lot of issues right now, so I shouldn't say it's the most important thing, period, because we have a president who might not want to leave the White House. What the? But um, we need to make sure that we have this ten, these 10 years moving forward, um, the seats drawn across the country in a way um, that actually reflects our communities and allows us to run competitive races and win. Um, and so redistricting is so very important. Now, the way that Colorado is doing it, is it the right way? I don't know. We're about to find out, you know? Um, you know, I, I don't know. We'll see. Senator Fenberg, I think you had something to say there. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of unknowns in Colorado. I, I think if, if we were doing this the, the same way that we had done it for, for the last several decades, I think we would know a little bit more about what to expect. Um, but it, this is our first test at Y and Z uh, implementation. Um, and I think in the end, we know um, it can only be controlled by the parties and the politicians uh, so much. Um, but again, like Leslie said, is this, the, is this gonna be the, the, the best way to do it across the country? We don't know yet. Um, and I would also, I, I agree with you, Ian, I, I think our districts are pretty fair. Um, I also agree with Ted that obviously Democrats largely drew those districts, but we didn't have the majorities uh, all the time. So it's not like it was egregious and, and was drawn in a way like we've seen in several states um, uh, for, for Republicans. Uh, but um, we'll see. I mean, there is no such thing as a perfect map. It's very subjective. You, you actually don't know how people are going to shift and move around and vote. Um, and I think the question is, what can you do to make sure someone isn't uh, unfairly rigging the system um, and drawing the maps for their advantage and hopefully making sure communities are represented uh, effectively? Rick, what do you think? New redistricting commission, good news, bad news? I, I don't know. I mean, I don't think anyone uh, on this panel or anyone else knows what's going to happen. I think that um, the sad part about this redistricting, though, and, and some of our friends on this, this call know way too well is that um, when it happens, it's big. When, it, when, it, when districts are drawn uh, in a way that um, are negatively impact one party or another, uh, it's big. And it has an ability to change trajectory of a state for sometimes an entire generation because you end up um, uh, being... Uh, the Republicans in, in, in some states may be swept into power. Um, they create some big systemic change. They nominate judges that are terrible for, for the things that we care about. And then it takes, again, an entire generation to undo the damage uh, that, sometimes, that sometimes happens. So it's one of the other areas amongst a million that we just need to remain uh, vigilant, right? 
For sure. And I think everybody made a really great point. I mean, on the one hand, like you don't want anybody gerrymandering the the state to make it non-representative like we see in a lot of other, especially Southern Republican states that have partisan redistricting commissions where they do it just to hold on to power. On the other hand, progressives often are playing by the rules when conservatives decide that the rules don't matter and what matters is winning at all costs. So it's always a balance between those two things. We'll see how redistricting turns out this year. Um, it's not in any of our hands uh, specifically. The last question I wanted to ask the panelists uh, before we do some closing statements, and first of all, thanks to everybody who stuck with us for the full 90 minutes here. This was a really interesting conversation, and I hope those of you who live here now know a little bit more about how we got to where we are, and it was hard fought, and it wasn't something that just happened by accident. And those of you in other states who are aspiring to be more progressive and, and win majorities and pass policies that reflect your people have learned a couple lessons here. But one of the things that um, progressives often talk about that conservatives tend to be better than us at is narrative, is setting messaging, is being disciplined, is always talking about the same thing. I feel like Colorado Democrats and progressives are not perfect, but quite a bit better than many throughout the country. Um, what do you think is responsible for that? Representative Herod, why, do, why are we able to put forward a progressive message that seems to uh, reverberate throughout the state and doesn't just, you know, concentrate in the cities? Yeah, I think it's also because, um, yeah, we stick to the narrative, but we've also had really amazing training. So uh, to your credit, Ian, um, Ted, Rick, you all have done a lot of training with candidates to help and created a lot of templates for candidates to help us understand how to have a good stump speech, right? But not in the boring way, but also how to respond and what people are really saying and how to listen. So, you know, I remember looking, working in the LGBT movement, I was at the Gill Foundation as well, and um, really understanding how we messaged around equality. And while sometimes I didn't agree with it or like it, I started to realize it's actually working, you know? This is how you frame it, that there's a reason for that. So we invest in those conversations and in that training, and I think that's really important. Um, the other thing I will say is like, get out of your head and get onto the ground, you know? So don't think that you need to be the smartest person on the room, especially if you can't actually relate to someone. You need to get on the ground, get to know the people and be able to talk at, at, at a policy level that makes sense. You know, if you end up talking for 20 minutes and we all know those candidates, 20 minutes in response to a question and you haven't said a damn thing, even if it's the smartest thing, but no one knows what the heck you're talking about, like you're not going to win over that. That, that voter, you're just not. Um, you're not gonna translate well. So just make sure that, that when we speak, we're actually speaking to people, um, not just in our own heads or trying to be the smartest person in the room. I think we do that well in Colorado. And again, I think we, we have a lot of training and investment in, in um, unconventional candidates to help them get there. Ted, quick thoughts on narrative, progressives, conservative, who does it better? Um, you know, the conservatives sometimes it, because they can just be negative, they can just say no to things. Um, sometimes it makes it easier for them to do the narrative. But what I think is important is always appeal to, and I'm sorry this word gets overused, but hope and appeal to, you know, values that actually <clears throat> matter to people on the ground um, and be resolute about it. Um, I don't want to be kind of the naysayer in terms of what to do. And I'm saying never do anything progressive, but I think it's important for us to calibrate how we do it but always be running all those progressive bills, knowing that you're not gonna pass everyone every time because you're basically normalizing it um, and getting people more used to it, getting more Republican support for it. And as, you know, as Steve was talking about earlier, you know, realize it's the long game um, um, that really matters. But I think in this particular environment right now, the progressive narrative is the one that's really controlling and in large part is because of the efforts of people like Leslie. Thanks a lot. Um, we only have about a minute left, so I'm going to turn it over to the panelists for some closing statements. Senator Fenberg. Uh, thanks, Ian. Um, thanks, everybody, for, for having this conversation. I think it's uh, really important that we continue to, as Coloradans, look about how, think about how we got here and um, where we're at now and how we build upon it um, and not just take it for granted. So, this really is an important space to, to carve out and have. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I, I wish we, we did it more often and hopefully we will um, in the future. Uh, but, but also thank you everyone for joining us. Um, you know, Colorado, I think often is looked at as a model and 
people often sort of romanticize or glorify what we've done over the last few years, but we haven't figured it all out by any means. Um, and so we have a lot of work to do as Coloradans. Like we were saying, we are not a solid blue state that can work on the progressive agenda that many of us really want to advance, um, but, but we're working on it. And uh, we would love to hear uh, the lessons learned from um, from other states and other folks and, and be helpful to you as well. So uh, don't be shy about reaching out. Um, and what I would say is in the end, you know, one of the biggest, biggest lessons I think we've sort of discussed is we need to stay true to our values uh, and at the same time uh, deliver on, um, on basic principles of governing once we do have majorities. And that's probably one of the best ways to guarantee that you're going to be able to stay there for the long term. Um, but thank you, Ian, for facilitating this and, and great to talk, talk with all of you. Petra, any final thoughts, Rick? I have five things, but they'll be quick. Um, I think they're, they're universal, not just in Colorado. I think um, we need to get out of our echo chambers, right? We, we need to meet people where they are. Uh, we need to, to listen. Uh, we need to learn and we need to respond. And I think that um, if we can incorporate those things into our daily lives, whether we're elected officials or activists, I think that uh, they will help us to fight for our causes uh, a, a, little, a little bit more and a little bit more effectively. Um, again, thank you, Ian, for inviting us. Uh, the work that you do in Colorado um, helps to, to empower our elected officials. It helps to change the narrative. And it's truly invaluable at, at um, making us all live in a, in a much better state. So thank you. Thanks very much. It was very nice of you. Ted, final thoughts? Um, I guess my one final thought would be part of the success I think here in Colorado is, is that we kept everybody aligned in order of winning and also around progressive policy, we would help each other. Um, I mean, the teachers were aligned with most of the labor unions, were aligned with the trial lawyers, were aligned with the environmental community, we aligned with, um, you know, diversity communities, the LGBTQ community. Um, and that has allowed us, I think, to win, but also to maintain um, some of that power. Because when you're out kind of doing your own thing and just hoping it's going to naturally balance out to where you're going to win, um, more often than not, you don't. The second thing is believe that you can actually win. You know, we were in a situation where we were so red, we were saying that we could start winning seats and people laughed at us. You know, they thought we weren't going to do it in 2004, um, and we snuck up on them. And so, you know, places like North Carolina, it can happen, um, but you have to believe it can happen. And Representative Herod, final thoughts, please. I just want to say thank you all so much for having me. Um, and thanks to my friends. It's good to see you all uh, via Zoom. Um, it's, it, it's been an honor to, to be able to watch as an, a, a newly graduate of college and really in college to see where we are now in Colorado. Um, we didn't get to talk about it, but when we were student leaders at CU, um, I was called, uh, so I was named as supporting terrorism by my Republican governor in the New York Times for bringing out a diverse speaking speaker series on the Palestinian and Israeli conflicts, right? And so um, to see that and then now to be in these positions is quite phenomenal. And we would not have done it without the support of folks like Ted, Rick, Jared Polis, who we haven't mentioned his part in this whole, whole scenario, but read the Colorado blu the, the Blueprint. It really does talk about what happened um, during that time. And Steve and I have another book. I can't, oh, All Politics is Local. Check out All Politics is Local as well, which really talks about the new era experience. Again, thank you so much for having me. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and we will see you at the next event. Thanks so much to our panelists, State Representative Leslie Herod, State Senator Steve Fenberg, Ted Trimpa, and Rick Palacio for joining us today for how the West was won and why we keep winning. And we hope you all out there keep winning or even start winning this election cycle. I'm Ian Silveira from Progress Now Colorado. Thank you all so much for joining us, and we'll see you soon. Stay safe and healthy out there, everybody. Okay.